Hello everyone, welcome to another work trip introducing and this is one that I'm really excited about so forgive me for being a little bit more giddy than usual. Um, I am so delighted to welcome Wendy to the stage. I'll tell you a little bit more about her in a second when I introduce her, her properly. Um, I am Sally, I'm co-founder of WorkTrip, and we are building a platform that helps teams to plan, book, and crucially measure off-sites and gatherings as part of their new cycle of work. So especially important as we all work in an increasingly kind of distributed way. Um, Wendy, I mean, where do I start with Wendy? Wendy, you have a very long and impressive bio. So I'm going to I'm going to read some of it to like warm me up into it. So Wendy um, earned her PhD in organizational behavior at Harbus Business School, where she began her intensive research on strategic paradoxes. And that's what we're going to talk about today. And that's really how leaders and senior teams can effectively respond to contradictory yet interdependent demands. And I think that's something that's that's really, um, you know, there are issues that a lot of our audience are grappling, grappling with. Um, she has worked with executives and scholars globally, taught at the University of Delaware, Harvard University, the University of Pennsylvania Wharton, um, while helping senior leaders and middle managers all over the world address issues of interpersonal dynamics, team performance, organizational change, and innovation. And she is actually here because she is author of this amazing book. Oh, can you see it, can you see it? There we go, Both and Thinking, which I consumed avidly and reached out to her. Um, and it was a number one release on Amazon for very good reason. Wendy, welcome. Thank you so much for joining me today. Sally, thank you for having me here. <laughs> so as a starting point, you have such an impressive career under your belt. And I, I mean, I barely, I didn't even touch on all the incredible roles that you currently hold at the moment. Um, but I would love to sort of go back to the beginning a little bit and know what drove you to study paradox and sort of both and thinking in the first place. I love that. Um, when, uh, when I think this through, I think there's two drivers. One was the research that I was doing as a PhD. But uh, more poignantly, uh, people often say that research is me-search, particularly when you're doing work in psychology and sociology, organizational behavior. We're studying the things that, are, that we struggle with. And when I think about the origins of my career, I had a number of career choices like many people do that I just felt really stuck in and that I struggled with for quite some time and that I felt really, um, stum I stumbled through. And so by the way of example, um, I really struggled when I was in university about whether what I wanted to do post-university. And in fact, mm -hmm. there was a point I, I was jealous. Here's all of, of all of my friends who were med students. Here they all are in uh, organic chemistry, super hard. They're all sweating through. And I am jealous because even though they're sweating through organic chemistry, they have a very clear, very certain, very specific path about where they want to go. And I had no idea. And I struggled, for example, about whether uh, I wanted to be someone who uh, what we in the academic world call practitioners, a leader, someone doing stuff, or whether I wanted to be in academia thinking about how people do stuff. And it felt very dichotomous and a real struggle. And then when I went to grad school and decided, okay, well, I'm going to do this academic thing, I still struggled with that question. Even more so, I struggled with the question of, well, what do I want to study? And I went to grad school in particular at an era where issues of corporate social responsibility, now what we call sustainability, were really hot. Uh, I wanted to study that. And I had an advisor with tremendous access to studying how top management teams at IBM innovated. And I felt like this was a massive struggle between access to this incredible data that didn't seem like it was aligned with what I do. And in each of those cases, that kind of competing struggle felt um, painful almost, felt really challenging. That's at the heart, essentially, of the idea of paradox and reframing that. And so I stumbled into paradox as a concept while I was studying innovation, 
And what I really think I was studying was how did I think about these choices and how can I do it better? Oh, I love that. And I mean, you see me nodding away. So much of this is familiar to me and I'm sure most people in their career paths. Mm. I was an English literature uh, graduate. So yes, there is no set path unless, you know, you want to be a teacher or a journalist or, or, you know, none of which particularly appealed to me. So so I really get that. And I, I think, you know, I've faced a lot of times in my career as well, where it's like, you go this way or you go this way. And you're like, well, what if I want to go somewhere down the middle? Like, what might that look like? Is that yeah. possible? So, um, so there's this sort of either or type thinking and both and type thinking. Um, and this was really important for me to, to, to sort of get to grips with and why I wanted to talk to you today because at work trip, we're sort of laser focused on helping teams to perform better and enjoy their work. Um, and the foundations of that are in sort of creating a rhythm that balances between two different things. So it balances between this sort of hyper-efficient distributed or remote, well, remote mode of working with this sort of high connection in-person experiences that really focus on sort of belonging and, and, and deep work. And a lot of the media noise at the moment is focused in, on dichotomies of, of the way we work, right? So come back to the office or go fully remote and embrace that. So I was really drawn to your work as a way to sort of cut through that prevailing mindset of of either or and and I would love you to sort of give us an overview of why either or thinking is is problematic and maybe why now is an interesting time to sort of reframe that approach yes and um, you know um okay so here's the bottom line of the book and of the work that I, along with my co-author Marianne Lewis, have been doing for the last 20, 25 years with a community of people. Here's the bottom line. What we argue is that we all face tensions, competing demands, tug of wars in life. And we face them at every level, whether it's at the top strategy of the organization dealing with innovation or sustainability, or whether it's in navigating teams, or whether it's in our own personal professional decisions, or our parenting, or our partnering. They come up all the time. It's not if we face these competing demands, it's how do we do it? And um, and I love the work that you are all doing around teams. And I hope we can unpack some of those examples because one of the early books around this notion of paradox was a book by Kenwin Smith and David Berg called Paradoxes of Group Life. And that really surfaced all of these tensions that you're talking about at the team level. And the idea here is that when we experience, the way we experience these kinds of tensions, challenges in our lives, they show up for us as what we call dilemmas. Uh, they show up for us as a moment that is pressing between these opposing ideas that invite us in or that are framed as a trade-off and either or. So they invite us into this kind of either or thinking. We have to pull it apart and make a decision. So we have to pull apart, you know, so whether it's things like, do we as a team stress collective, cooperative behaviors, or do we encourage individual needs and address their individuality? Do we attend to people's well-being and notice and, and respond to burnout? Or do we highlight and focus on performance and getting the job done? To your point, do we focus on people's learning or do we focus on their performance, that learning in the long term that requires and is costly and requires time? Or do we focus on short-term performance and getting stuff? All of those, as you said, they show up for us as these dichotomies that invite us in to making an either or choice. And so as, as, you, as you noted, there's some, what we argue is that while this is natural and it happens all the time, we find in our research, this is, we, we would say limited at best. There's another way. And it's detrimental at worst because it causes problems. And what we say is that this kind of thinking actually leads us down these really detrimental, vicious cycles. And I can sort of walk through what that looks like, but I wanna just pause there for a moment. Um, 
just to see where that lands us. And then if if not, I can certainly walk through like why and what are these cycles? No, I would love I would love you to do that because the other thing that comes up to me, you know, the the devil's advocate part that comes up for me straight away is um well, if you're trying to navigate these paradoxes, don't you just come up with like a bit of a, you know, shitty compromise? Do you know what I mean? You know what I mean? You're trying trying to do those things. Is it just the worst of everything? So I, I would love you to give kind of what the examples that you were going to give first, but also have that in the back of your mind of, you know. Yeah, yeah let's put a pin in that because um yeah. so so I'll, I'll tell you about why I think or why we have found or why research is pointing to these problems of either or and then we'll put a pin in okay well is both and just sort of a bland compromise because that is a question that I get a lot and it's a good yeah. question um okay so here here's the deal uh what we find is that when we pull apart when we live into these opposing ideas and pull them apart and then try and make a decision between them we, we identify sort of three ways in which we end up in these vicious cycles three sort of patterns of of problems and the first is that what happens is that we are faced with this opposing these opposing ideas we make a choice and then we reinforce intensify it go down what we call a rabbit hole so this first is the rabbit hole where we just continue to reinforce the one perspective that you are focused on because you have for a variety of reasons. One is because cognitively you're committed to it. Two is because you've created structures that reinforce it. So it, it, if one example is, how do we think about the culture of our teamwork? Do we emphasize individuality or do we emphasize collectivity? Well, it may be that we're thinking, gosh, we've been so individual for so long. We are going to focus on collectivity. We're going to all work together. And that is great because it allows coordination. But in the extreme, collectivity you know and then we it's we have to all be at the team meetings together we all have to be around the water cooler everybody has to make the decision together which on one hand there's an upside to the coordination but in the extreme what ends up happening is that that kind of coordination can you know kill in people's individual autonomy it becomes really costly and timely but we reinforce that kind of mode of collectivity because that's what we know and that's what we're po focused on and so we go down this rabbit hole and and don't sort of shift and change and then and then when things shift around us and we change we end up what we say over correcting going completely to the opposite extreme and so we call that the wrecking ball because essentially when you're moving to the other side you are as as people might use the expression throwing out the baby with the bathwater you're throwing out the good with the bad so we might move all the way over to a much more individualistic culture an individualistic in individual decision making and then we lose all the benefits of the collectivity so on one hand we go down one path too long on the other hand we swing and then the third pattern and actually this is the most pernicious and particularly in teams this becomes problematic the third is when we take a point of view and then we get defensive to reinforce that point of view and we get into conflict into you know direct tug of war is defensively with the people who take the opposite point of view. And this happens in our teams. It happens in our partnering. It happens in our organizations. It certainly happens at the political level, at our national level, where instead of saying, hey, we have these two different opposing perspectives and maybe there is a way of bringing them together to be more effective and come up with better and more creative and sustainable decisions, we're just stuck in conflict with each other. And so we call this third pattern, we name it the trench warfare, because we are trying to point out and highlight how we dig a trench on our side. We reinforce this, this notion of confirmation bias. We confirm and reinforce how we do things. And then we sort of shoot out at the other side without being in relationship with them and dehumanizing that other side. And that becomes particularly pernicious in this either or thinking. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that is such a powerful image, isn't it? And I think, you know, we see this play out a lot in the the media conversations and the very public battles around office, right? In office or not office. And it's like, you will come in, you will not, you know. Uh, uh, and there's this real sort of push, pull that, that feels, it feels, 
feels like it's breaking things down, you know, even just from the outside. I can only imagine what it feels like on the inside. I think the work, the the hybrid work is a huge example. If we can just pause there for a minute, um, I'm living this right now. So I, uh, as you mentioned earlier, I said that I have several roles. One is to lead um, a center at, at the university, a women's leadership center. And we are navigating that right now as we figure out what does it look like to come back to work? The university is navigating that. We see this broadly. I've been working with companies that are really struggling with this. What are the rules and the policies that we put in place in order to enable? And and as you said, we're swinging from, gosh, we were all at home and we had this autonomy and people really loved it. But wait, how do we go back to collaboration? And while we call it hybrid approaches, we're not really figuring out how to bring these two together in an effective way. What we're doing is putting in a whole set of rules that don't actually solve the problem effectively. So I think that's a great example. Lovely. It's so, an example of the swing, right? We've swung yeah. to one end and now we're trying, we're swinging back to the other end without thinking about, well, what was beneficial about the autonomy of that we all had working at home in the pandemic? And I, I would love to pick up, we can continue to pick up on that hybrid work example as we kind of go through and talk a little bit more about what, you know, both and thinking actually encompasses and maybe some of the things that we, we can use. So I think it's a really, it's a really good one and, and really relevant to the work that we do as well. Um, let's go into that thorny question of isn't both and just a bit of a compromise? Yeah. Least something bland in the middle. Yeah, yeah. And so just to give a sense of what we mean by both and so, you know, if, if I, as I was saying earlier, we feel these tug of wars, we feel these tensions across our lives, they show up for us as a decision that we have to make between opposing ideas. And what we um, argue and what we uh, is that underlying each of those decisions is this idea of paradox. And so if I just get a little sort of abstract for a minute and wonky, you know, I was just um, parenthetically, I've been reading or listening to on Audible, this great book by um, Tyson Yunkaportu called Sand Talk. He is an Aboriginal thinker. I just spent six months on sabbatical in Sydney. I've been curious about Aboriginal uh, thinking. He's an Aboriginal scholar and academic. And he argues that one of the best ways of thinking about issues is to move beyond seeing what is at the surface and look at the underlying patterns and not just the patterns between things, but the patterns that then can be generalizable beyond. And so our argument is that this idea of paradox is a pattern of the way that our world works, that if we notice it and see it, allows us to make better decisions. And the idea is that we experience these competing demands in our decisions, but if we look beyond the dilemma or trade-off that presents itself to us, beyond the question of hybrid work, in or out, how many hours, how many days, what should we do, and look underneath, paradoxes reside underneath. And what we mean by paradoxes are competing demands, comp opposing forces, or we, we call them persistent interdependent contradictions, things that are contradictory, opposing, dualistic. And yet, if we notice, they are also interdependent with one another and they never go away. So underlying questions about, well, how many hours in the office? Well, how much do you know, how much team time do we have? How much individual quiet time do we have? Underlying that are these persistent tensions between doing what we need to do for ourselves and doing what we need to do for the broader collective, cooperation and competition, self and other, focusing on the short term and focusing on the long term. Those paradoxes, uh, they, they underlie these decisions, they don't go away. And what we know is that um, over time, effective societies, and this is, you know, this is evolutionary biology, evolutionary history, over time, the most effective societies are the ones that are able to balance cooperation with competition. They allow for individuals to rise and be autonomous and contribute to and be supported by the collective. You know, it's, they, they allow for, they think about what am I going to do in the short term and how do I navigate long-term goals? And so if we refocus into that kind of thinking, that pattern and see those paradoxes, that invites us to think about our dilemmas in a different way. That invites us into the both and thinking where we can say, okay, Instead of making this decision where it's either or, how do I look at what is valuable about each of these approaches? What are the highlights of each one? And how do I think about bringing them together in a synergistic way 
that allows me to be able to find a more creative, better possible solution. Okay, now I want to pause because I've said a lot there, but I also want to address your question about a bland compromise. Yes. Right. So, so, so I'm proposing, okay, well, that leads us to more creative possibilities. And you're saying, well, well, isn't this just like, you know, what happens? Isn't this a bland compromise? And yeah, it can be if you don't do the work to get to a better solution. And in fact, one of my favorite, and I love quoting uh, scholars, is a woman named Mary Parker Follett. She wrote in the early 1900s. She was, she was uh, located in Cambridge, Massachusetts. And in the early 1900s, she challenged us to think about this kind of integrative approach. And what she said is, look, we tend to think about these either ors that are one wins and the other loses, and that's not good. And then she says, well, then we end up with these kind of you know, compromises where it's like, okay, win-win, but actually somebody is always giving into the other and it's not that effective. And that's what you're talking about. And then she said, but wait, then there's integrative thinking. And she uses this great example where she says, hey, imagine that I am sitting in the library and it sounds very quaint in this time that there's a library with books and, and she's in the library and she is sitting next to an open window and someone comes in and says they want to close the window. Okay, well, should the window be open or should it be closed? It seems like a very clear question. It can't be both, you know? And and she says, okay, well, you know, the, the either or is open or close. The bland compromise is, okay, well, maybe halfway open. You know, so maybe that's the bland compromise, but then I'm not happy and she's not happy. There's a question of, can we get to a better both and? Well, to get there, you got to start with, why do I want it open? And why does the other person want it closed? Let's start exactly. there. Okay, well, I want it open because I want fresh air circulating. Well, they want it closed because that window is blowing all their papers and annoying them. Okay, so then let's ask the question, is there a solution where I can have my you know, fresh air circulating and they can have, you know, they can avoid the papers blowing what's possible. Oh, well, then if you start there, then you can open up all kinds of, well, maybe we can open up the window next door so that I can get a little bit of fresh air, but it doesn't directly blow on your papers. There's your both and possibility. Oh, what a great example. I love that. I'm going to use that repeatedly, Wendy. Thank yeah. you so much. And, you know, the reason why I, I smile so much is because I see, I see real parallels in, in lots of the conversations that that we have with with customers who um, who want to bring their teams together. And there is the look. There there are reasons why we want to do it, and there are reasons why we may you know, like. Do we do this in the office? Do we do this somewhere else? Do we do like what where? And it's exactly right. It's digging in under the surface to say, okay, well, why? Yeah. Why do you want to bring people together? Yeah. And thinking about, you know, we actually talk about a cycle of work. I think we've been sold a bit of a, a lie about work being linear, right? And you start here and you set your goal over here and you just go. And that's all the charts that we look at, all the metrics are how are we getting from the here to here, ideally in a straight or exponential curve, right? Straight line. Um but that's not how any of this works. It actually works in in cycles. You learn things and sometimes the goal moves and it changes. And, you know, and we think, well, why wouldn't you have a cycle of work that also reflects that? So if we're saying that there is a time for collective work and deep thinking and long term focus, let's build that in to allow us to free up the rest of the time to maybe be a bit more individualistic or hyper efficient task focused you know get these things done and, and out the door this week yeah. so if you start thinking it like that then you can actually build in a bit of a rhythm and you know in our experience that isn't the compromise it's actually finding one of those underlying sort of factors and, and building that into a sort of new structure where there's a time for these different modes. Yes. And, um, you know, uh, about a year ago, uh, Marianne and I wrote a piece for Fast Company because we stumbled across an organization called Rocketbook. Rocketbook was an entrepreneurial venture that has now been um, uh, acquired by BIC and they make um, uh, electronic paper. So you can write on it and it's digital. And um, they really thought this through and figured this out. 
And what they do really well is that they do a deep dive into, okay, so why is it that we want to give people autonomy to be at home? Like, what are we, what are we valuing there? What's the, so the value is, is that people have more control over their lives, that people we know have incredibly busy lives. And instead of pretending that the rest of our lives don't come into our work day, that we can give them some opportunity to engage with that. And then we can give them a sense that they have more, again, autonomy, control, value, you know, individual time to think and do their work. So what is it that we really value about being in the office? Well, we really do want to make sure that we have time to work together, that we have collaboration, that we are connected, that we build trust. And so then they ask the question, okay, how do we structure our approaches so that we really value each of those, right? Because right now hybrid, it's like, okay, three days in the office, two days at home, you come in the office, nobody's there. The people, you're all sitting on your computer talking to each other on Teams anyway, like, <laughs> or you're at home and people are checking in on you about whether you're on Teams on your computer with a check mark, so you don't really have the autonomy to do what you need to do. So they said, look, when you're home, and, and this, this was really serviced by a whole lot of great tech, when you're home, you're home and you have control over your schedule. And we're going to use great technology and teamwork and calendaring to know when you're available for to get onto team, to get on a meeting or what have you. But otherwise, no one's looking over your shoulder if you have to go drop off the dry cleaning or pick up the kids or whatever you have to do. Culturally, that's part of assuming you get your work done. And there's a culture of getting your work done, but doing it within your own schedule. And when you're in the office, we're going to make this valuable office time. It's going to be the full office meeting where we're all hands on deck meeting, or we're going to have everybody in the office around the same time so we can work together, or we're going to make this valuable time. And so mm -hmm. they were being so thoughtful about that allowed them to really gain the benefits of this hybridity and this, this dual mode. And just to put some language around this, one of the things that we describe this as in the book is practices of separating and connecting. Yeah. Differentiating tell us, tell us more about that. I love, I'm big on like tools and frameworks yeah. that can help us kind of get there. Yeah. So this is one of the, the practices that we say it helps with this both and. And what we mean is in order to get to a better both and, you need to be able to pull apart, know what's at stake in each of these options, analyze each approach. What do we mean by in the office? What do we mean by at home? What do we value in those? What's the expectations? What's our goals in service of? And by the way, that's what we typically do in our either or. We pull things apart. What's But that then in the either or mode leads us to say, okay, well now which one's better? So you make this pro-con list and then you say, which one's better? Here we say, you got to separate, pull apart, make your pro-con list in service of asking the question and finding better ways of how you can connect, find synergies, come up with better, more effective, more creative solutions. Oh, I love it. And there are so many brilliant examples in, in your book. I mean, I have, I've put down so many different pages because they're really great diagrams as well. I think I'm a very visual person and sometimes it's really, it's lovely to see that little kind of like infinity sign that you have between sort of all these different um, areas and examples of how businesses have done this with different challenges that they've been looking at. The Lego example is just beautiful it's a really really nice nice one I think um so yeah if, if this is something that anyone is listening to and is is struggling a little bit to get their head around I would really recommend the book because I think it's got some really sort of tangible examples in it um and well, I mean we're coming to the end of our time but we are massive massive content nerds Sophie and I um we're both English students <laughs> listen to a lot of podcasts so um I would love um I would love to know from you like what books I mean you mentioned a couple of amazing research things we'll we'll try and sort of pull out some of those links and be able to share them with people as comments in in under this event because I think that'd be really useful but what books podcasts or shows are you really sort of into right now that you think we should add to our our playlists oh so many um <laughs> Well, I just want to, again, give a shout out to Yonko Porto's book. I would love to, I'm, I'm going to reach out to him at some point because I think having just spent this time in Sydney, there is, we, it really, by unpacking other ways of knowing, ways of knowing that go far earlier than, you know, some of the very Western approaches that we lean into, we can also just sort of challenge some of our own assumptions. So I think it's kind of brilliant and fabulous. Um, I, uh, 
And I am also a huge fan of Mary Parker Follett. If anybody ever wants to go back and get and geek out about organizational theory, <laughs> Mary Parker Follett, for sure. <laughs> uh, there's a great book, The Prophet of Management, written by Paula Graham, that brings her work together. Um, I, um, I think one other piece that I just want to surface is that when we invite people into both and thinking, it's not easy because it surfaces all kinds of emotional anxiety. And a key uh, tool that we point to in the book is Whereas we also we have to shift our mindset, we also have to think about the emotional component of this. And we talk about it as finding comfort in the discomfort. And I have been a huge fan of psychologist and Buddhist Tara Brock and her work on radical acceptance, which is one of her books, yeah. about how we start with acknowledging and accepting that this is emotionally challenging to accept that another person who you think you know has a completely opposing view from you to to honor respect listen and accept that they might have a legitimate point of view and you could both be right that's hard that's emotionally hard and so uh, i'm a big fan of her podcast her work and her book and gosh sally i can come up with so many more but i'll pause there that's beautiful and actually that reminded me of um, a CIPD event that Sophie and I were at ages ago about hybrid working. And there was someone on stage who said, of all the conversations that I have had to navigate um, over the years, this one about bringing, back, bringing people back to the office or not feels the most personal. Mm, yeah, yeah. It feels really personal. It feels like it needs to be navigated in a very different way from everything else that, that was very like numbers based because we don't have the numbers and it's it feels much more like my opinion versus your opinion, my needs versus your needs. And and yeah, and I think that's very rarely acknowledged. So I love your recommendation there. I'll just say we um, I'm working with my colleague Ella Marone Spector and in INSEAD and some of our other colleagues because we're studying the extent to which leaders can more effectively manage these emotional conversations by doing two things that have to go together. One is naming, honoring and surfacing the fears and anxieties. And the other is simultaneously offering hope about and, and value and, and reason and motivation, the why for the bigger purpose, bigger passion, bigger hope. So how do we, you know, do these two have to go together for leaders to be able to navigate that? Oh, wise words. I can't mm -hmm. wait to read more about that when you mm -hmm. dig into it a little bit more. Hopefully that's next book. <laughs> um, it has been such a delight having you here, Wendy. Thank you so, yeah. so much. Thank you on behalf of, of our audience, uh, live and recording, uh, watching back. Um, yeah, it's been an absolute joy. Well, thank you, Sally. And good. I, I so value the work that you are doing. So, so thank you. Thank you. All right. Take care, everyone.